it's a day that will forever be imprinted within me and yeah, everyone else who was there that day. The Battle of Danny Boy began when a patrol of Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders were ambushed at a checkpoint near Majar Al Kabir. When the door opens, we're going to go hard, fast, and aggressive. We don't go back. Definitely the hardest battle that I've had to fight, which was to clear my name. With allegations that go much further than casual abuse. The accusation against the British Army, war crimes. They made us out to be like horrendous, barbaric killers. And I was thinking, oh my God, then the press went wild. They brought this exhibit 1171 up. And I'm like, oh God, how do I deal with this? No one's here, no one's supporting me either. Have you dealt with all the trauma? Or have you suppressed some of it? Woody, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, thank you for coming on. It's uh, I'm really excited by this. Genuinely excited. So let's get cracking. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. How did you first get into the army? Mate, I was destined, like so many, to be a footballer. And uh, I was with Chelsea, actually at the same time as John Terry. Uh, my dad was serving his country. And it was very difficult for me to make training Tuesdays and Thursdays when my dad was very committed uh, to the military. And then it was just a bit of a nightmare because I was missing training, like, or I was late and it just didn't fit. So I then got picked up by Reading and then just didn't make the cut. What age were you here? I was... 15, so 14 at Chelsea, 15, 16 at Reading, mm. and then wasn't strong enough, released. And then I just needed to do what my brother at this point was now doing in the military and my dad. And uh, yeah, just go and volunteer my service to this great nation. And that's mm. where it all started. Wow. And what did, did you, did you have the military in, the, in your blood, do you think, from the family? Mate, we've got over 300 years unbroken service. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. To this country. And um, that's like four or five. I've got to how many generations that is. Oh, it's many, Loads. many, yeah. many generations. Wow. Yeah. You know, my granddad um, was Dunkirk and unfortunately died in Edinburgh Castle because of exposure, actually, for being in the water too long because mm. his selfless commitment was getting everyone else on the boats before him. Wow. And he was just in the water far too long and uh, unfortunately passed it, Edinburgh Castle. But yeah, I had a duty, I think, to serve my country and uh, to keep our name, you know, sort of embedded in the legacy of, of service. Mm. And where did you go? Just explain to me, was it a certain art, was it a certain part of the country you went to? I joined, I'm, I'm Scottish, believe it or not. Yeah. And my dad uh, is from Glasgow, my mum's from Edinburgh, my, my brother is from Edinburgh and my sister was born in Germany mm. um, through obviously my dad's travels within the military. And uh, we were stationed down south when we were very young. I caught the English accent and uh, thought, do you know what, I'm going to shave my own path. I'm going to join the Hampshire Regiment, which is the Princess of Wales' Royal Regiment, Tigers. And um, yeah, off I went. Do you know what, I went and done all my interviews on my own, went to the careers office on my own. And um, I had to grow up quite quick. Mm. And uh, yeah, I went off my travels, you know. I I now can relate to my dad leaving me at the, the train station at Lippock to see me off because my son is now in week 13 for the parachute regiment. Is that right? So yeah, oh, so wow. he's keeping, yeah, he's um, he's absolutely focused, mm. you know, very robust kid. And But do you know what? I didn't think I was going to get as much... Emo well, I, was, I didn't think I was going to get as emotional as I did saying mm. goodbye because I mm. drove him up to, to his training up north mm. and uh, dropped him off. His mum was crying the whole way up there because our, fa our family now is never going to be the same again because yeah. he's away now yeah. and it's left a huge void in our family. How old is he? He's 17. Okay. And, um, you know, cuddling, looking him in the eyes, I tried to grip my teeth mm. and like just kind of got away from it. And uh, Which I don't mind showing some emotion I'm only human yeah. and it's my son at the end of the day mm. and do you know what through and we'll get into it soon but through mm. what that boy has experienced mm. the courage to still want to serve after what I went through yeah. is a testament to yeah. him yeah. and his values yeah. and it's credit to him and yeah I just think it's brilliant for what he wants to achieve mm. and like I said he's he's full of 
determination, true grit, and he's a motivated individual. Mm. So all the best to him. Yeah, it's great. Absolutely. And what age were you when you started? Same, same age. It was. Yeah, 16 to nine months I was actually, a bit younger Bloody than him. Hell. And tell me, tell me through, how old are you today? 40. 40. Tell me your journey. Yeah, so I went into the military at 16, nine months. That's young, yeah. 16 in the Six, military. That's yeah. mad. And them days, yeah. you had to grow up sharpish. Yeah. And um, a lot of character building. Yeah. I was tested in many ways. Um, you know, different to kind of my peers who I went to school with. They went in their trade or they went to college, uni. I just said, nah, I'm going to go and serve mm. my country. And I joined 1997. And yeah, it was just an experience. It was full of camaraderie, teamwork, discipline, values, everything I was already aware of from my dad and my brother. I was I had an, I had a bit of a head start through yeah. that because my dad yeah, you know, he's a very strict individual. Um believe it or not, non drinker, non smoker for a glass Ouija. I was gonna say for a Ouija. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's not very many. But very kind hearted. Yeah. But also his he laid the seeds with you're not entitled to nothing mm. in life. If you want something, you've mm. got to work hard for it. Nothing's ever gifted. Yeah. You graft and you work hard, you learn, you fail, but then you go away and then you redesign what you need to do yeah. to achieve. And that's kind of that it was embedded within me in, mm. as a young boy. And I took that into the military, got to my regiment in Canterbury, um, where we were five airborne at the time, and uh, went on my first exercise to America got to understand what it was like to go away um, on exercise, the intensity, uh, the ownership that you need to to, to take. Um, you have to, you know, like I said, grow up quite quick. And then my first operational tour was Kosovo, which was peacekeeping actually mm. in, in 2000. So what? So you were in that you jumped in at the age, let's call it sort of 16, 17. Mm -hmm. When did you go to Kosovo? I went to Kosovo when I was 19. Okay. 19 and 20. Like? It was just after the civil war, really. So the Albanian Serbians were at it, weren't they? So, what were you going there to do? Just peace keep, Peace-keep, restructure, okay. rebuild, okay. give clear direction, and um, you know, just be that well peacekeeper yeah. and making sure that our the, the hearts and minds are there because children of war. I've seen it yeah. a number of times. It's really hard. It's brutal, and yeah. it's just trying to stabilize that and. Uh, but I'd seen some shallow graves when, when I was there and opened my eyes up a little bit. I'd seen a, coffins just constantly coming through the borders. And as a young boy, mm. I was like, well, yeah, well, that's mm. a little bit of an imprint. And um, But when I was also that age, I didn't know what that emotion was. It was never spoken about in that organization. It was I was in an all-male organization, very red-blooded alpha male. Yeah. Everyone wanted to be the best version of themselves. You were tested. Yeah. You were always competing every day. Yeah. So to show that kind of, it's not weakness, but back in the day, it mm. was maybe looked upon or frowned upon as being weak if yeah. you showed some emotion like that. But, but I imagine there'd be a lot of men in there going, just man up, mate. Yeah, crack on with it. Yeah. Get a grip now. Yeah. Why are you slinking away there? Yeah. We've got focus. We've got a mission in yeah. hand. And you're thinking, well, I've just seen that. Yeah. And that's like abnormal. Mm. So it's going to have an effect on me. Mm. And that, that there was a couple of things that did open my eyes a little bit, like I said, and um, but got to understand what it was like to go on operations, the intensity, the build up to operations, and actually when you're out in country and how, how hyper vigilant you need to be. So from a young age, I understood what it took to go on ops. And then uh, I did two tours of Kosovo, done twenty uh, two thousand, sorry, two thousand and two, and then two thousand and four. That was it. I went on to Iraq, and it was the most testing in all avenues um, that I've ever been tested as a human. It was chaos, mm. confusion, carnage from when we hit the ground in 2004. Wow. Wild it was. Did you? Did they say you're going there for a certain amount of time? To... So Yeah, it's always normally six to seven months you're going to be away for, and we know that. But you do pre-deployment training, which is our build-up training before you go away on ops. You probably do about five months of that. So you're away for about a year mm. from, from the family. Wow. Yeah, it's a long time. So you know, how, you, how are you communicating with the kids? Let me see. Sat phone. Okay. When it works. When it works, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> I left my son actually in 2004. He was four weeks old. Wow. And um, kissed him on the forehead. Had my bags on my shoulder. 
And at this point, we started to get a lot of intel on the lead off to us going that it wasn't going to be peacekeeping, it's going to be full on war fighting because all the peace talks had broken down. And the main militia leader, Muqtada al Sada, he um, called these shuras, which are big meetings with the main militia leaders, and that was it. Every coalition force is going to get hit, and they're going to get hit hard. The Americans were at it in Baghdad and Fallujah, so on, and we were in Al Amara, which was north of Basra, oh, the hornet's nest. Wild. It was wild west. Never ever experienced anything like it. No. And that was from landing. As soon as we went in to our camp, Abenaji, the mortars were coming in, the rockets were coming in, and I've never experienced anything kinetic, mm. anything violent like this. Mm. And uh, yeah, I had to sort of get hold of um, myself, understand what it's going to take for six months to stay alive and to keep my men alive. And I was 23. Yeah. With a bit of pressure. Yeah. But you've got to, you know, you're tested in different formats as a soldier and leadership, um, decision making, being inclusive. You know, all of this is is given to you at a young age mm. and you really have to grab hold of it, understand mm. it and then deliver because me personally, I like level headed leaders, which are infectious, I believe. Yeah. And uh, they're not shouting, they're not screaming because you switch off from that. I like to be given clear direction with an end state and how I'm going to achieve it. Mm. There's your resources, move. Mm. That's what I need. Mm. So I took that on board from a young age and then that was the leader I was. I, I tried to be calm in the moment of chaos. Mm. And I was experiencing that with the other guys from day one. So just tell me, Just I want to visualize, what was it like day to day? What were you told to do day to day? And where were you sleeping? Where were you eating? And what was that feeling like for you? Yeah, so we were in a... A camp which was surrounded by Hesco, which, which is, is like uh, these huge baskets, massive baskets filled with sand, stones, just to take impacts okay. from okay. like shrapnel when yeah. rockets were coming okay. in. We were initially in um, soft skin accommodation, like uh, cabins, but because of the amount of rockets, they had to bring up these ISO containers, double stack them, and have sandbags all at the top. Mm. Um, so if any rockets were coming yeah. in, it all and we were no aircon, yeah. so we were in Iraq. It was like eighty degree, and the beds that we were sleeping on were these like bastardized bunk beds with wood. Yeah. Oh, it's it's not. I laugh now, but ain't even <laughs> funny. It was horrendous, <laughs> proper sweat pouring. <laughs> but if you went for a shower, it was a risk. Okay. Of getting mortared attack. Yeah. So you go out there quick because the shower was outside out of the... the block yeah was so it? out yeah run a lot, a lot of them are in sh uh, solar shower cubicles so okay. it's not luxury showers yeah. it's just basically a bag where it's been heated in the sun you're in there quick we call it adobe quick adobe yeah. wash bash and uh back in accommodation but there wasn't you're either on five minutes you're either on patrols yeah. so you're out of camp yeah. and you're reacting to firefights you're reacting to rocket attacks and and uh there was no uh re stabilization at this point because we were just full on war fighting there was nothing we could get we could grasp because of the intensity then five minutes quick reaction force qrf five minutes qrf 20 minutes qrf and then maybe a bit of rest qrf quick reaction force mm. so if something happens and there's casualties yeah. then you're deployed as a, as a backup right okay so you're on five minutes where you're just waiting in all your kit so you're sleeping in your kit yeah because you're only five minutes you need to be out vehicles rolling five minutes you've got 20 minutes, you can take your boots off and then rest. You can have your showers, yeah. a bit of food. But it doesn't always work like that because, you know, flexibility for us is a, a principle of war and you've always got to remain flexible. Never get um, angry at certain situations because you can't control. There's no point worrying about something you can't control. If yeah. you're sent, you're sent. You've just got to go out and deliver the best that you can do on, on whatever mission you've, you've been told to do. And day to day was... Normally, it was snap vehicle checkpoints because we were looking um, to interdict on just trafficking of weapons, drugs, um, IED bomb making kit, and also getting a, like a, the iris scans thumbprint. So we're trying to build up patterns of players yeah. who are moving in and out the city because yeah. if someone's on our radar, then the thumbprints will match. Yeah. And it's just constant sort of um, intel building up on these players. Yeah. 
And uh, but it wasn't very often we got to do that because it was just someone was either a casualty. I think that our regiment from being there initially for like 14 days, we had taken 12% casualties. It was so you're always either out fighting 12% casualties of what number? Yeah. 450. So 12% of that 450 yeah. every day was coming in with casualties. That was within, a, that was within an exper- uh, a, a time frame of a of i would i would probably say two and a half weeks wow. of being in country wow it was just i was exposed early doors to a lot of trauma from seeing my platoon sergeant who i looked up to um, and wanted to imitate because he was such a professional leader yeah. very organized um just a really good egg yeah and and people who served will be able to relate to this you just get the people who can make things happen and he was one of them he got hit by a petrol bomb off um off a mosque roof by a kid and it hit his helmet and uh i was like third person on the scene and he was in the middle of alamara town center on fire screaming oh my god for someone to help him and, and the water that we had was boiling because of the we had no aircon in the vehicles it was just boiling water and then i give him um my morphine which is only 10 mils doesn't really touch the sides yeah. and just seeing skin drop off a human being like that it was like yeah it was carnage but that was one of many situations wow. that i that I'd, I'd been involved in mm. uh, trauma wise mm. you know, the first of may i hope you don't mind me just no gonna, mate the woody carry on yeah first of may um we we're actually on a resupply so there was an outstation in the heart of Alamara, which was just getting smashed. It was like Hawks Drift. It was every day they were at this building and these Who? Boys, the militia. Yeah, the militia. The, were, yeah. Were, were. So we had a company, uh, Y Company, which was our support company. Yeah. They were in this outstation called Simic House. Yeah. And they had to occupy this outstation. Their task was to do what you can, but you have to remain occupied within that building. It's our footprint. It's our... It's our position of hold. If we lost that, it would have been a massive win for the militia. Right, okay. But they were fighting horrendously. Well, they wanted ago. it back. Yeah. And they, they knew just, you lot were all in there. And they said, hold on, man, this is our this is our country. We'll give that back to us. We're going to fight you for it. Yeah, yeah. Right, it, was, okay. it was run by the militia. You know, the, the civilian population. And who are the militia? So they're the Māori army. They're an army which are... Um, a legit army or just a... Ma- no, it's not the luck of the Iraqi army. It's like right. a... a sort of a, a terror okay. uh, organization okay. which want to bring harm okay. on coal- coalition forces uh, similar to the Taliban yeah okay and how they they how they operated in Afghan so we we're forever up against it and they were under siege and each time each day we had to go in as a company strength so it's probably about six seven vehicles we would move in as one and in the back of our vehicles we would have rations food ammunition water batteries everything to keep them alive and, and keep them fighting in this stronghold we would go and deliver wow and so you uh, must have been a target even just going to deliver right well i'll tell you now yeah so the first of may we were on what year 2004 Four still yeah. yeah okay we were on our way in to do this resupply when our vehicle that i was in was hit by two at4 soviet union missiles coming straight for the side dodge I tell you now, I was more scared this day than I was going over the top during the Battle of Danny Boy on the 14th of May. But the 1st of May, I've had two rockets come straight through the back. It's taken my breath away. I can't see anything. The panic, the buzzing in my ear because I'm, it's, my ears, eardrums have gone. The confusion. I don't know whether whether I'm dead or alive, if I'm honest. I'm yeah. trying to, to not understand the situation. I thought we hit a landmine. Yeah. And then the smoke, I just remember it being so thick and dense. It was horrendous. And then it kind of disappeared slightly out of the turret, um, which is like a big opening where the commander and the gunner sit and that we're in the back. And I looked and my platoon commander, who is my boss, was on the turret floor unresponsive. And my gunner was screaming that he's burning. And there was a fire on the left-hand side. And uh, in a bit of panic... I've grabbed hold of the fire extinguisher above the door and I didn't really, it wasn't a traditional like pull the handle mm. and it sprays out. Yeah. It was like, what's going on? And then 
the lad opposite me, un- incredible name, is Crucifix, New Zealand lad. He uh, he looked at me, his nose was kind of dangling down because it had been mm. hit with shrapnel and it just took mm. his nose clean and it mm. was just dangling down over mm. his lips and he like moved his thing and said, well, Woody, you need to smash the back of it for it to work and throw it onto the fire because it takes the, yeah. the fire off. So I was like, all right. In, and then, like I said, in a state of panic, I smashed it. But as I smashed it, he was like, but we're not meant to be in here. And I'll, I'm committed, I'm too late. So yeah. I smashed the extinguisher because what it does, it just draws all of the oxygen away. Right, and, okay. But we're in there. Right, okay. So it's drawn all of oh, our right. oxygen Jesus, away. Yeah. So I've thrown it onto the fire. It's taken the fire out straight away and it, we've just, it's, I can't explain it. It was like someone choked us, yeah. like full on grasp around our face. I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. Mm. And even the other lads are looking at me like with their eyes wide open. I'm thinking we are done. Mm. And then I felt my feet wet. And I thought, cool, my feet are really wet here. What's happening? And I looked and our diesel tank, which is in the back, had oh, been Jesus. smashed and split. And now it's wow. filling up to diesel up to yeah. my shins now. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a fire, which has just been put on the left. I'm thinking we're going to burn to yeah. death. I'm screaming at Johnson Bahari, who then went on to win the Victoria Cross, mm. which is the biggest accolade for valor. Yeah. I'm screaming at him, Johnson, just drive and get us out of the killing area. Just drive because I can hear everything outside mm. of the vehicle. We mm. were in the biggest ambush ever. And I'm screaming. I'm choking. I'm thinking, well, how do I stop choking? And then, believe it or not, years ago, I watched a film called Backdraft. Mm. And um, it came into my head, Backdraft. Soak the rags with water and use that as a filter. Mm. That's what something told me. Okay. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do that. Yeah. So I got the water out, got the rags, give it to the guys. Irvin was bleeding out really bad. Like he had, he had um, a, like a sort of self-tourniquet around his groin area to stop because he hit an, hit an archery in his leg. And uh, like I said, Crucifix was just opposite me with his nose hanging down with a massive like chunk of shrapnel, like a credit card within it still bedded in there. And then I had shrapnel to the, my arm here, which I just thought was a super um, sort of subsurface wound. And I've grabbed it, but as I've pulled it, my arm has come up. Mm. So I knew it was deep and I mm. thought, cool, that's bad. And then my face was just riddled with like pebble dash with mm. shrapnel. And uh, the vehicle fired up. And managed to get out of this main killing area. Mm. And we ended up going to Simic House, which was our safe haven, which was the you know, our mission anyway, to go and resupply, but on the way down there we just got battered. And when when the gates at Simic House opened, someone who I have a lot of respect for um serving opened my back door. And the look on his face told me everything I needed yeah. to know. He yeah. was like, What is yeah. even going on here? There was all sorts of diesel, blood, smoke burn the whole thing and i was like that was an average day mm. let me tell you mm. and uh, there's not very many times i've really been scared for my life but mm. for sure that was one of them because i wasn't in control of the situation i was mm. relying on johnson to go out and d- just do what he needed to do to yeah. get us to this safe haven yeah and uh about 40 minutes after that that incident the adrenaline started to wear off because it's like that's like an out-of-body experience it's like a drug you can't even buy from anywhere it is like so many people will, will tell you when you're in a firefight you're overwhelmed with this adrenaline this yeah. this drug that is just like an out-of-body experience mm. once that run like thins out my eyes started to really um play havoc and i was like blinking it was like blinking like glass I thought, oh, I'm going blind. So I started to worry. I said to the lads, I said, hey, lads, my eyes are really bad here. They're, they're, they're really, like, cause me problems. So I ended up getting flown to Basra as a as a um, a priority casualty because my eyesight was deteriorating mm. really bad. And I went there for uh, into the field hospital for five days. And I was just... One, I felt that I was letting my men down because... I was now away from them and I was itching to get back up north to be with them because it's it's hard to explain. When you're even a young leader, you've got responsibility yeah. and you feel that you're letting people down if you're not doing what you're supposed to do on mm. operations and it really ate away at me. And so I went to see the doctor and said, can I have an eye test? Because they weren't going to fly me back up until I had this eye test. So they'd done this, um, basically what it was is all my irises and stuff were really badly deep scratched. So I wasn't going blind. They were just damaged. Yeah. But I just couldn't. It was had blur vision. And they weren't going to fly me back up until I completed this eye test. Mm. So I was always in the doctor's ear. Every time they checked up on me, I said, I want to see a doctor. I want to see a doctor. 
can I go? Can I go? Can I go? And he's like, no, no, you're not ready. You're not ready. So day five came. I said, doctor, I said, please. I said, I'm good as gold. I can see 2020 vision. Mm. And I was like, I was clearly lying. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I wanted to go. Yeah. And he's like, right, I'll give you an advanced test. If you pass it, you can go. I was like, sweet. So I've gone into this, like just a normal eye test. You're like, I don't know, 10 meters away from the board. Mm. You put one hand over your right. Mm. So he was on the left hand side. And he said, right, put your hand over your left eye. And I was like, oh, here we go. So I needed to like basically open my hand so I was mm. basically looking with both <laughs> eyes, but yeah. just bluffing him. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he knew, I think he knew what I was up to. Yeah. He passed me and then I was, yeah, straight back, straight back up. Wow. And then- Were you angry at this point? No, I don't think you no. have time to, I, I was I was hurting because we had lost, you know, Adam Llewellyn as a casualty. There was many more that were, were casualties at mm. this point as well. and. I was I wasn't angry. I was wanting to make a difference. I wanted to, you know, be supportive of my fellow soldiers. I wanted to, to help them, and because I knew that they're under a lot of pressure. And yeah. when you are losing men, it becomes even harder to achieve, you know, anything really. So I flew back in country, and then um, a few days later, yeah, that was when the Battle of Danny Boy happened. Tell me about the Battle of Danny Boy. I watched I watched the uh, the drama on yeah. BBC the other night and I was blown away. Like, jeez, yeah. tell me about that. It was it's a day that will forever be imprinted within me and yeah, everyone else who was there that day. It was it started off like a just another normal day. There had been a um, a rocket attack on on Camp Abenaji. We were sent out as a QRF quick reaction force to interdict the mortar base plate team and. Um, so we set up a vehicle checkpoint and then we were pulling over every vehicle that either looks suspicious or every fourth vehicle or every fifth vehicle we'll pull over and we'll do a search from inside the vehicle to then out and then occupancy of that vehicle will be searched and the iris and stuff would be taken. And then as I was doing this, I got a call on the radio from my commander, Chris Broom, and uh, he said, Woody, stop what you're doing, collapse the vehicle a checkpoint there's been an incident, and that's all I knew. Yep. I said to the boys, right, stop what we're doing. Let them go. We need to get back into this vehicle. Got into the, the armoured vehicle that we were in. Got the headset on that I can speak internally on internal com uh, communications with my commander. A bit like this on the headset, yeah. actually. Yeah. So I said, what's going on, Stick? He said, there's been an incident, two casualties from the Argyle and Southern Highlanders from a Scottish regiment, yeah. and we've been told to go down and extract them apply first aid and get them off we've got to do that within the golden hour we work with the golden hour basically from point of impact we've got an hour to get them to a specialist field hospital yeah. for the, the the quality of work they they produce yeah. so that was it we were on the way down route six which was the main supply route from Basra all the way to baghdad very vulnerable route because yeah. it's only one road in it's like the m25 yeah. it's just one road in one road out really yeah. and um on the way down there well we were hit with um, another overviolent situation at this point, and I'm in the back. How I many know, men? How many men in this vehicle? There's the driver, gunner, commander, and then three of us in the back. Yeah. So this vehicle, our vehicle, is getting like smashed now, and I'm thinking this is not normal. We're normally getting we're normally getting hit when we're in the city. Yeah. This is out of the city. It's very yeah. random to be hit like this. I uh, looked on the map, I thought, I'm sure we're here. Because you get disorientated in the back, you try and keep up with where you are, but it's difficult sometimes. And I thought, we're not even in the city yet, definitely not. But I didn't want to get onto my commander's ear because he's got a lot that's going on at the moment. He, we've just been ambushed. He needs to identify the stronghold, give a fire control order, and then start suppressing and trying to win that firefight and then make a decision. So they were doing that load of noise, even in the back where it's quite muffled. You can hear the chain gun, you can hear the 30 mil giving it big licks. And you know, you're in the back and you go through all sorts of emotions. You know, fear is probably the biggest and it threatens to rip through you and control you. Yeah. But for me, I, I'd been tested now and I know how I knew how to kind of suppress that fear, but also use it to my ability and, and in you know, my favor. And like I said before, it was very, it was very um, important for me to 
be level headed. So when things were quite extreme, I would try and be calm in yeah. the moment and reassure and, and guide the lads in the back. That's mm. what I was trying to mm. do. But it's difficult because when we've been hit a lot, you know, you're thinking, is my is my luck running out yeah. basically? And then, uh, so I'm going through all this emotion. It's like, God knows how hot it is in the back. It is at boiling point. Sweat mm. is pouring off you. And then the adrenaline again, you're up and down, up and down. You know, my heart is smashing against my body armor plate, thinking this vehicle that I've been in has already been penetrated yeah. by missiles before. Is it going to look after me now? Yeah. You don't know. It's, this yeah. question's been asked. And uh, then Stick gets on the radio and goes, right, Woody, we're not having any effect with what we're doing here. We need boots on the ground. Prepare you and your men to dismount and counter this ambush on foot. Wow. So you're jumping out of a vehicle now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I laugh now, but I weren't laughing at the time, no. let me tell you. Yeah. And um, I said, okay, can you repeat that? Because it's not a word of a command you get told to do yeah. that often. And he said, yeah, we're not having any effect. When your boots on the ground, prepare you and your men to dismount and launch. And I was like, all right, okay. I told the boys in the back. And they looked at me with their emoji eyes like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, <laughs> look at now, this is going to be mad. And you could hear it outside. Yeah. It was lively. And I'm like, okay. So I asked Thick if there was a bit of cover that I could leave this vehicle and go into yeah. to then give myself a bit of planning time because it's, it, like I said before, it's disorientating when you're in the back. It's quite dark in there as well. Mm. It's going to get a little glass, little glass window that yeah. with condensation and grit, you can't see a lot mm. out of it. Then you've got the noise, which is confusing. And I thought, if we get it wrong, we're going to be dead within seconds. So we need to just get to hold in position first, relax, cigar moment, then we plan, and then we commit. Mm. So he's like, yeah, when the door opens, it's 11 o'clock, there's a ditch. Go to that. That will give you some cover from fire and, and cover from view. We'll we'll look after you up here with uh, suppressive fire and fire support. Stand by. I told the boys, said, all right, we're going, boys. Wow. Yeah, I said we're going when that door opens. We're going to go hard, fast, and aggressive to this holding position, and then we'll just that will be phase one. Then we'll figure out what phase two looks like. And um, I said to Stick, right, okay, we're good to go. And I, I tell him, man, my heart was beating so fast. I was going regardless because I think that's a trait of leadership. I shouldn't. I'm not prepared to to ask someone to do something that I'm not prepared to do myself. Yeah. So for me to go first was the right thing. It was showing that. I back what I've been told, we commit, and then we'll deal with whatever happens in that position, right? That was phase one. So I said to boys, you good? And I got their nods. They didn't say much. Mm. They just looked at me and mm. just give me the nod. And I said, stick, we're good to go. And it was like, okay, we call it HR, which is on where you're going to go and launch when, they, when it's that countdown, we're off. So five, four, and on three, our doors, because they're armoured, they're really heavy. It's on a hydraulic system, so mm. you press the button and it opens up quite sharpish. Mm. And I was like, five, four, three, and on three, it started to open quite quick. And then the bright sun had peered in. I was like, 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock, where is it? And then bang, I saw this prominent scar feature, which I knew that was what he was on about. And the noise was horrendous. It was like, I put my head down, I looked, and then I was like, go. And I just ran hard fast and aggressive and i tell you what when you watched it and you've seen them boys in that film get out and run yeah. that's exactly how it was yeah. it was carnage yeah and i managed to get into this ditch i looked to my left hand side and seen the other two lads come into this ditch with me yeah and then we had a bit of a a laugh if i'm honest it's a nervous laugh you're like oh, fuck it. Yeah. this is nuts it's yeah. bonfire night like but it's <laughs> so bad Mate. and i'm having a bit of a laugh at that the lads are like yeah. this is wild whatever are we doing and it's like okay this is phase one no one's injured no one's hurt just have a check look for sort of blood spots no we're all good right cigar moment because you're entitled to that mm. you're entitled to your moment mm. even in the most extreme of pressures yeah it's like right how do i now get from here and the end stage to take that position. And then you just do your estimate. So can we go right flanking? Can we go left flanking? Or do we just go straight down the middle, hard, fast and aggressive? What, and just hope no one's shooting at you? Well, we knew they were shooting at us, but we need to just be better. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. The enemy position at this point I, had, I hadn't seen. So I knew I had to get eyes on to figure it out. So I, I, I crawled up 
and I was like a meerkat. I put my head over, and then I could see this. Tr- it's called tracer. So yeah. the ammunition light up. Yeah. And I saw so much of it. I thought, it's mm, a big ask. Yeah. But I didn't want to say that to the lads. So yeah. I was like, okay, I've seen it. It's 120 meters away. There looks to be a good amount of militia fighters in there. And we were told from the vehicle there was um, a- around 10 militia, okay. 10 to 15 fighters dug in. But that was a rough estimate, and there was three of us at this point. Yeah. And then we were randomly joined by two other guys. Yeah. One was another commander. We had a conf lab. We discussed the best course of action was to go straight down the middle, and we work in two like two teams, a three and a two, and we just give each of a fire support, leapfrog, one foot on the ground, and we just go, and then roll it up. If we took casualties, we would leave them until the end, and then we'll go back and do it, uh, the, the casualty extraction once that main position was clear and um yeah i just remember thinking bloody hell this is now looking back it's like what the greatest generation did yeah it was getting up and going over the top across no man's land and Mm. that's what we did and i remember saying to the guys look we go once we commit we don't go back we go forward and then we just keep going and bags of aggression determination true grit desire and that unstoppableness attitude, and sometimes that big shots like that come in if you have if you display that, and it's just you know having that courage to commit, mm. and uh, that's ballsy, right? What you just went through there, jeez. Yeah, I mean, looking back now, I think I'm lucky to be here having yeah. a chat with you, really. Yeah, and you're um, a quick runner. I think I was flat out <laughs> on that day. <laughs> I think I was <laughs> like you saying bolt the day. I was off. See you later. <laughs> but it's not. It's 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 to do with tactics as well. It doesn't matter how quick you run. If you work as a team, you achieve much more. Mm. We know that in business. Mm. You know, it's not Absolutely. the individual can do so much, but yeah. you've got to have other people who are better than you around you to, you know, have that end state, which yeah. is a lot better. And this is the same as the military. And even if it's a small team of five, it's still teamwork. Yeah. And that's what we did. We went over the top. My first bound. That was it. We was in a full on engagement then firing they moved past so us. what did you see then so you've run you've run 120 meters then you landed what did you see what was what, what was going on there you don't run 120 meters straight away yeah. you do it in bounds so yeah. three of us we discussed that we were going to do work in two teams yeah three of us would move probably about 10 meters we'll get down we'll start firing the this lot would then move the two of them uh, okay past us they would fire okay, give us okay. cover we would fire so okay, you're like yeah, leapfrogging yeah, yeah. each yeah, other yeah and then we get closer and got closer, 50 meters away, I could start making it out how many they were, and oh, there was okay. a lot. And then 40 meters, I could start seeing some of the militia fighters withdraw. Yeah. So I'm thinking, we've got a foothold here. Yeah. We're the aggressors now. Yeah. You know, this if this is our patch, we can do this. And then we get closer 30 meters away. And then as we're just about to go in and roll it all up and basically eliminate any militia fighters who are still fighting, that's what we do, and it's called pairs, pairs, pairs. So as we shout with pairs, pairs, pairs to go in and roll it up, all of a sudden they threw their weapon systems down and surrendered. And it's hard to get right, but lawfare states that you cannot engage anyone who has now got their hands in the air. We understand that, but it's hard to get right. Because yeah. when you're fighting for your life and to stay alive, yeah. you'll do anything yeah, to, to stay, stay alive. alive. Yeah, absolutely. But we're educated on rule of law we understand in the rules of engagement and we got it right yeah. a lot of confusion initially because there's weaponry everywhere yeah there's trauma there's militia fighters who've been hit with 30 mil so they're not even together yeah there is pieces everywhere there's young fighters there who are dead unresponsive you know young gaping, fighters young fighters what sort of age groups? 16 17 okay. year old fighters okay. there yeah. with gaping holes within yeah. them and i'm seeing this for the first time yeah. this is close and personal yeah. stuff so all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh, how do I now deal with this? And I wanted to get the weapons away from them out of reach because opportunities. And I thought, well, we need to get them away. Then there was like loads of trauma around and bodies everywhere. And then uh, we arrested the militias who had put their hands in the air. And uh, we told them, uh, sorry, we separated them from the enemy dead because it's the right thing to do. We blindfolded them with like mine tape and their shemags that they were wearing because we didn't have really in them days. What, have, do they, what do they look like? What are they wearing? Dish dashes. So they're long, dish dashes yeah. with machine guns. Yeah. 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 And with like chest webbing. 
they had their chess weapon all laid out and stuff with their RPGs. Some had been fired, some hadn't been fired. It was just, well, it was a punchy day. And we got there. So we managed to then control the situation. I sat down after about 15 minutes of what this what was happening and I had my first drink of water and I was like everyone who we were gagging for water yeah. so we had our first drink of water and uh, then my sergeant major turned up out of nowhere and this shows you in the film yeah, as well yeah. and he said, said Woody is the battlefield clear and do you know what for a split second I wanted to tell him it was yeah. but I knew it wasn't yeah. so Dodge I needed to be honest with myself and my values that I stood for and my integrity and say sir it's not clear and he's like what do you mean I said I saw militia fighters fall back he said, right, put a fresh magazine on. You and I are going to do a clearance patrol. Right. I was like, who? I thought, <laughs> I can't believe it. I was like, weird, weird. Oh, but if I was going to do a, a clearance patrol with anyone, do it, it would have been yeah. with Sergeant Major. Okay. What an inspirational leader. What's of his name? Man is. Oh, we call him Bug Eye because he's got big eyes yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah. But his name's Dave Faulkner. But what an incredible man. Incredible. Um, and, and I had the pleasure of serving a long time with him, mm. really closely with him in Kosovo. And then now in Iraq, so I knew how he operated, and we went off to start this conduct this clearance patrol. Just the two of you, just the two of us. Don't know why that decision was made. I haven't got a clue. Mm. Especially when we know that there is enemy out yeah. there. Two of us went forward, and then within about ninety meters, that was it. We were decisive in another engagement. Sergeant Major ended up being um, off, you know, quicker off the mark than the militia who tried to engage him. Eliminated that threat as I bounded forward. I could basically reach out and tap this mate on the head. That's how close it was. He'd come out from a little um, sort of gully with an RPG just about to launch off into my chest space, and I, you know, put you know three or four rounds into him. But like I said, it was the noise that he made afterwards and the choking and stuff stuck with me for a mm, while. Because mm. then I just pushed forward and I see him. I was like, oh, he's in a bad way there, mm. and then pushed forward, <laughs> and um, and then. I remember saying to my sergeant major, we're quite vulnerable, just mm. you and I. There's militia fighters out here, we need to go back mm. and get you know, more people on the ground than this because it's just too much. Yeah. And he's like, I agree. And then on the way back, Dodge, well, I heard a noise. And then I spun round and a flicker in my eye, see people. And I was like, what's going on there? Two more fighters with weapons then stood up, spoke to us. They spoke to us in Arabic. And I was like, I had my weapon just about to engage and mm. they threw their weapons down and then surrendered. And uh, on the way up to them, I thought, I recognise, I recognise you. Mm. So you asked before what is one of our roles and responsibilities when we go into foreign fields and into country, and it is to mentor the Iraqi army yeah. and the Iraqi police and give them some tuition and some tips what we what, which we use. So I'd been doing that on and off while fighting. It was only one of the uh, Iraqi policemen that I'd been mentoring who would then... You're joking you know, me. ...gone up against me. I was like, and he didn't even care. Smirked to me. Oh. And I just thought, Judas, man. Yeah. You know, that's just, they don't care. Yeah. They do not. You can't trust anyone. And I was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I can't believe it. Arrested them two, took them back, sat down on the bank and had some more water, trying to, like, sort of take all this day in and then uh there was a command made by our higher um like way higher brigade yeah generals and you yeah. know colonels and so on and so forth that we had to go and collect the bodies now and that does not happen normally you leave the bodies in situ and their own will take care of their own yeah and i was like even at 23, young Lance Corporal, it didn't really sit right with me. I thought that shouldn't really be happening. So you had to go and clear up all the body, the dead bodies. And where did you put we them? We had to take them where back, them? load them onto the vehicles, take yeah. them back to camp. Why? Because they thought the main militia leader, because it was such a pre-planned attack on coalition forces, they thought the main militia leader now was either captured or killed in action. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Taking someone's life, yes, I'm a frontline soldier, I could easily say, yeah. I punched in, destroyed him, punch, didn't have care in the world. Yeah. It has an effect, mate. Yeah. It's when it's close and personal. Yeah. And then you have to go back and pick that young 16-year-old up. Yeah. And it's a, it's a dead weight with all sorts coming out of yeah. him, like holes yeah. and dripping. And it's just horrendous. Jesus it's God. going to have a lasting effect. Of course it and is. I'm only, it doesn't, I don't care who you are. That is extreme trauma. Yeah. 
and I'm like now picking this body up and it, and it like I said it, it showed you a small clip in the film loading it on loading these bodies on in clear bags parts in clear bags because stinking honk, honestly honk, yeah horrendous 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 hour loading these bodies in and that wasn't that wasn't even the worst so what happened is we load them all up then our challenger battle tank broke down so then we had to wait around even longer on this battlefield for recovery to come in and pick them up it was still red hot sun had gone down at this point it was getting dark we then managed to get the vehicle fixed got in when it was really dark the big lights were on loaded everyone's running around getting involved turned up at the gate i was covered in blood covered in blood mm. and um my rsm was a regimental sergeant major who's a big dog yeah. And he said to me, right, Woody, ground command your vehicle to the regiment laid post. The doctor's there with the body bags. He's going to give you clear direction. And I was like probably battle shocked at this point. Yeah. I was exhausted. I'd seen so much. And I was like, I just want to get this day over with. Yeah. It's horrendous. Ground commanded the vehicle because it's a tracked armored vehicle and you need to make sure it's done properly. Ground commanded the vehicle. The doctor was there. He said, right, Woody, okay. Get the back door open. This is what needs to happen. First body there, second body there, any parts over there, and it was just like horrendous. So I said to the boys, right, get a vehicle open. And I said to you before, it's on a hydraulic system. Yeah, yeah. So the button's pushed, nothing. Oh, I can't believe it, because I know the only other way to get that door open is for someone to climb through over the dead bodies. Oh, Jesus, go on. In the yeah, vehicle yeah. and hand crank it from inside. Yeah. And I can't believe it. I said, lads, listen, there's only one way to really deal with this. Mm. And this is for us to get around this mini circle and do rock, scissor, paper. <laughs> and we did that, you know, and my driver lost. So he put a shamag around his face and I'm, we talk, we spoke about honking stench. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking now that these bodies have been in over maybe two hours at this point. There was open chest wounds, open stomach wounds, mm limbs the clots which are now filled up the back of the vehicle man fat like you name yeah um feces you name it now i can i could smell it out the armored door Jesus. and the armored door is like that's bulletproof it's thick yeah. right and i'm yeah. thinking oh man so my driver's got a shamag around his head head torch on he starts climbing his way through and he's like we're trying to encourage him don't worry he's going mad reaching yeah. it's like all yeah. sorts then he starts to hand crank this door open and he probably got it to about where you can squeeze out sideways. And uh, I had screaming, loads of screaming. I thought he's had a panic attack in there. Mm. So I was like, gone round. He's then ran past me shouting, he's alive, he's alive. Mm. And I thought, like, he's alive. And I've looked in there, in the back. He wasn't alive because of the nature of his head wound. Yeah. But he was set up bolt right with his eyes open and it's obviously triggered yeah. like something with him and he's gone past me. But that incident alone has affected him to this day yeah. like really bad he's in like uh, he's been in um, some real mental health battles yeah. with with what he'd experienced and, just uh, can't get in that just can't get that out of his mind yeah wow yeah it's just been really tough and then we had to like then take them all out it was a horrendous day horrendous day and then I eventually got to the burns pit where the oil drums were took my kit off and then burnt them and I couldn't care if rockets had come in at that time. Yeah. I was not interested. Yeah. At this point, I was just done with it all. I managed to go to get the solar shower, leant over and then just washed the blood and all the dust and desert stuff come out and just rolled into the to the you know, the, the sort of, it wasn't even a plug. It was a man-made Jesus. hole in the ground just so as it dripped off. And I just thought, that's carnage. But we never spoke about it, Dodge. That day was done. The next day, we had to, they, we hosed the, the vehicle down. We're back out in the same vehicle and we're finding chunks of skin and all that days later. Yeah, it was yeah. still, the smell was horrendous. Yeah. But we didn't have time to reflect or even talk about that day because we were back out fighting again. Yeah. And that was the 14th. And then the 1st of June, we were at a, a police station, Broadmoor because we name like so cool how the military do business. Yeah. It's really smart. So the, our different operations during our big battles in Iraq were like Battle of Waterloo, Pimlico, Hammersmith, yeah. you know, all cool underground stations that yeah. they were named after. Yeah. And then this prison, Broadmoor, we yeah. called it. And then we actually had that as an outstation, like a 
QRF, quick reaction force yeah. location to get to the town quicker to try and have an effect. Yeah. So we were we were occupying this. Rockets started to come back into camp. We were called to go and eliminate the mortar base plate from a, a grid that they'd given us. It's a location that where they were on the way down there. It was just a huge come on. Um, this is what they do, isn't it? They, they know that we're, we're going to react to situations and they know that. And on the way down there, we were battered again. Johnson Bahari was hit pretty much point blank with a rocket propel grenade unresponsive i was then tasked by my commander again stick to leave the back of the vehicle under fire me and coops another another lad in in the in the vehicle we jumped onto his front of his vehicle looked in there unresponsive like head wound like i've never seen it was really in a mm. bad way jumped in there grabbed him pulled him out under fire like, things were tinging away ting ting mm. like the guns were going it was wild i was just so focused getting him out and um what was really good about Johnson Bahari is a pri he was a private soldier at the time, so you know no rank, just you know was a private soldier, had responsibility, was a driver. But what he did in his own time, he taught other people how to drive this armored thirty-three ton vehicle just yeah. in case yeah. a situation like this happened. That's great leadership mm, from someone forward yeah. thinking. Yeah. You know, yeah. worst course of action, and this has now happened. So mm. Coops is like, I can drive this. I said, What do you mean? Because we had to get this vehicle off this like big contact point yeah. I said what do you mean he said Johnson Bahari in his spare time showed us how to drive this I said are you sure he said yeah so Johnson's in the back with me I'm trying to you know, keep him alive I'm hoping for the best that he can drive this vehicle and I said to stick right let's go I've got Johnson he's got a weak pulse let's get him away yeah. and he would get back and we're, I said we was in Broadmoor so they had two big Sangers with the Hesco big baskets yeah. either side but Coop's Obviously, he could drive it, but he didn't know how wide this vehicle was. So he comes screaming through the main gate, and it is quite narrow. So if you're not a driver of an armoured vehicle, you sometimes yeah. you know you're going to clip something. Mm. He had come through, taken the whole side of the Sanger out. <laughs> Mate, he's up there on Century. He's taken him like clean out. Luckily, he was not that badly injured, yeah. but like, in the moment, adrenaline as yeah, well. He wasn't a driver. He just yeah. done it in the moment. Hit this Sanger down. That come down, and Johnson. Yeah, flew out, and then the, the next time I saw Johnson Bahari was at Buckingham Palace when I received the military cross, and he received the um, the Victoria Cross. So tell me, when you met the Queen at Buckingham Palace, what was that like? It was incredible. Other than my marriage to to Lucy, and uh, and my kids being born, it without doubt the best you know, experience that I've ever experienced. Um, turn up to Buckingham Palace with my my mum and dad, and uh, Lucy was incredible. You know, I had a Vauxhall. Uh, SXI 1.2 <laughs> and we drove there and I was in service uniform and my dad was driving and he kept he's from Scotland and he gets flustered about the in London the roads and it is mm. it is tough mm. so he's kept on going in the bus lane I said dad you're going in the bus lane you're going to get fined all the time you're doing it just get off the bus lanes yeah. and because he's all agitated and uptight and he's quite a fiery Scotsman yeah. He's like, I tell you what, you drive. I said, I will drive. I said, pull over then, I'll drive. So we're having a full blown argument yeah. before we get to Buckingham Palace. We've pulled <laughs> over, right? Randomly, horns are going the whole lot. I'm in my service dress. I've got out the passenger seat. He's got out. We've done like, like this loop. I've got in the, I've had to put the chair back. My mum and Lucy have squeezed it back. Can't believe we've had a row. And then I, I've actually drove in with my ammo boots in my car into the gates of Buckingham Palace. Quality. So it's just like little things like that is incredible. Went in and the Queen pinned my medal on my chest and said it's, not very often I do this, and when you wear it, you wear it with pride. Wow. But then years later, you know, the shadow kind of appeared, and, and Churchill once said, you know, a medal, a medal glitters, but it also casts a shadow, and it was case in point for me for what was to come. Mm, wow, wow. Tell me, you had that super high there, and then it went into a ridiculous low, wasn't it? Mm. A real super low. Tell me about that. Definitely the hardest battle that i've had to fight which was to clear my name from allegations of murder mutilation and mistreatment from danny boy headed up by um a human rights lawyer called phil shiner um it's a it's a pretty famous case it went on for for years and it ended up being 31 million pounds of taxpayers money and uh yeah it was just i knew how to be a soldier dodge right and i was i was given the tools the training to be this soldier to deal with 
what we were going to be dealing with in foreign fields and how to react. But what what I wasn't trained for was to fight a harder battle on my home soil to clear my name and to look after my integrity, which were tied to my values. It broke me. It broke me that much that I had to go and seek some professional support. Why was this lawyer go out to create a case like this? Because he believed that these were innocent farmers going about their daily business and we turned up caused chaos took them back some alive back to camp line up against the wall and just killed them in cold blood and like cut bits and pieces off them and stuff well he was accusing you of doing that yeah yeah it wasn't accusation of you going into battle and, and bringing 10 men back with you it was actually after that yeah it was so their their allegations were that they were innocent farmers yeah going about their daily business and we had a just a full-on gun gunfight with, with these innocent farmers and then took them took some back alive lined them up against the wall and also massacred them and uh i was like that ain't gonna get traction even how even how i found out about the allegations was through lucy there was a letter delivered i was on my commando course down at um Limston to earn my green beret and uh, i was like halfway through the course arduous course as well and then i get like I look at my phone, there's loads of missed calls. I'm thinking something's wrong with the kids. My phone up and she's like, look, there's a letter being delivered and it states it's going to be a public inquiry oh and the allegations are murder, mutilation, mistreatment. And that was it. That was the start of the horrendous roller coaster. Then it went on to Panorama called On Whose Orders. They made us out to be like horrendous, barbaric killers. And I was thinking, oh my God, then the press went wild and I was getting phone calls and what year, text what year messages. What are we talking here? 2009. So this one, so when you landed back in 2005, you had four years of being a hero, and then all of a sudden out of the blue, this came. Yeah. My God, Will. Yeah. It was it was the toughest, toughest. Everyone will go through some adversity in their life. Mm. Life is beautiful, but you will have you would have to emotionally negotiate your way through adversity, whether it be in business, yeah. whether it be at home, yeah. personal life, sport injury recovery or whatever and i know that i'm not the only person to experience this but you know this was at such a public level that everyone was everyone knew about it the press were putting it on tv it was just like how do i deal with this no oh, one's cool. here no one supported me either so the duty of care was zero and i was like i'm getting punished here i don't know how to deal with it my god what, was, what, what were you thinking at the time where were you at the time were you at home just watching it on telly going what on earth is going on or were you in camp or i was what? on that course when i so it was just like flicking in and out of it then i got home and then yeah i was called into london for interviews after interviews after interviews. i couldn't shake the ballad danny boy i couldn't shake it because it was constant constant if if lucy was here now she would be like every week there was a file that thick getting sent through of statements asking me to reread sign process reread oh ah oh, it was it was horrendous to the point in 2014 i then went into the dock and i was cross-examined by these. so this went on for five years yeah. yeah five years yeah and then went into the dock was cross-examined by and i've got respect for the law profession because they're incredible what they do they're very clever they're they've gone a, they've, they've gone the hard yards to get there i've got respect for yeah. that however what I didn't have respect for is them questioning me and my ability on the battlefield when they have not got any credibility of warfighting. Yeah. They don't understand the noise, disorientation, the intensity, the decision making. You get it wrong, we're dead. Yeah. They didn't get that. So I'm they're asking me these questions which are annoying me and frustrating me, and I'm trying to bring the battlefield into context yeah. in this courtroom. I'm not clever enough to do that, Dodge. I'm yeah. just a soldier who volunteered my service for this nation. Yeah. All of a sudden, I'm pleading to these people who've got no idea what it's like yeah. to be on this battlefield that none of the above had happened. Mm. You know, it, you know, it's infuriating, but I've been in some pressured situations. <laughs> Seeing that doc for three hours, that was pressure. Yeah. But I remember my lawyer said, anything that you trip up on or it takes you by surprise, have a sip of water just to give you that cigar moment. Because I said to you, yeah, cigar moment yeah, again. When you get pressure, yeah. it doesn't matter where you're in and what environment yeah. you're in, you're, in you're, you're entitled to your pause two, three, and breathe moment. Yeah. And that was mine. Because they, what had happened was, I they had, they had this photo 
and we shouldn't have took the photo it was poor judgment and i own up to that and i speak about that and it's also shown in the, in what the, is the photo of us we how many took, men who was there they were just taking the position yeah. in danny boy yeah the pow's were lined up a face to the floor blindfolded and we had a we had a photo yeah a bit of a trophy photo yeah. ready and it's bad drills to do yeah. and i've apologized for it and there's nothing i can do now it's yeah. done but i didn't know this photo existed so when i was in the dock they brought this exhibit 1171 up and this is my cigar moment because yeah. i've looked and i'm like god so i like grab this water and well, how am i going to answer this yeah, yeah yeah and i just said it's unacceptable i was honest yeah so that's unacceptable play, yeah. and i apologize for that because yeah. that's not how it was it's the first time i've seen this photo it's not a trophy photograph but yeah. it doesn't look great and i apologize for it but um yeah, that was a that was my hardest fight without a shadow of a doubt was to really punch through this like long stretch of challenging times from I dread to think what your mind was going through for that five years i needed help if i'm honest and i got it i went and seen someone who and a professional psychologist yeah we sat down and it was the best thing i'd ever done because we revisited all the trauma yeah. You know, my second tour of Iraq. So I went back out on a second tour of Iraq under allegations and I've done Afghanistan under allegations. Now looking back, I thought, that's crazy. How are yeah. they sending me out when I was under allegations? Yeah. But I yeah. did. I went and done a further two tours as a leader, as a senior leader as well. And my second tour of Iraq, I experienced more trauma because it was a quiet tour. It was the end. What year are we talking now? We went 2009. So it was... The later 2000 and latest 2009 we went out second tour of iraq quiet it was us ex filling from country basically we had done our time yeah. in iraq very quiet and then unfortunately um one of the lads put a weapon in his mouth and pulled the trigger and i was third person on the scene to that and i just couldn't escape trauma it was just constant <clears throat> so then i arrived and you know, that's something I never spoke about when I started re uh, writing the book. Oh my God, I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake the smell of the burning flesh. I couldn't shake what I'd seen. And I thought, oh, this is... Had he just had enough of it? His dad had such a close relationship with his father and he was diagnosed with an illness which was terminal and he couldn't cope with that and being away. You know, the thing is, if he had spoke about it, yeah. we could have sent him home yeah. and given him compassionate, but it was just too much for him and... Oh, it's hideous, mate. Mm. It was hideous. So tell me, on that day when you were in the court, was that the day that you could have got convicted and put behind bars? No, I wasn't on trial. No, okay. It was, it was basically finding out the truth yeah. before it went to a trial okay. stage. Yeah, and um, and just before it was going to be a, a like the judge was going to make his decision they found that paperwork which was key evidence which was all of the militia fighter that were named were attached to their fighting group oh i know result. but they but the thing <laughs> is it should have been done a lot sooner yeah but they said it was human error that wow. they shredded it by accident and they found a photocopy in this in this amongst all this evidence that they had to trawl through but ah oh, it's just frustrating because yeah, it's just like I don't know. Well, you put yourself through all of that. For, t just tell me, what was the what was the motive of the lawyer who took this on, on behalf of the Iraqis? Was you was he from that country? No. Was he British? Yeah, he's British. Yeah. Have you met him? I've seen him. Have you met him since? No, he no? didn't want anything to do with the film. Um, I would have a beer with him, really. Believe it or not. Can, we set, thing is, can we set that up? Nah, he, he's, they won't even do the film. I said, Let, let's meet for the film, you know. We, What's his name? Phil Shiner. Phil Shiner. Yeah. He was. He would not want anything to do with it. We couldn't even get his story that Toby Jones played him, played him remarkable as well, but he didn't want anything to do with that. He won't. Any, I, I would want to know that question. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Was it Was it money? Yeah. What was the motive behind Maybe. it? Maybe. Was it because he'd done some good work previous with the Bahamutsa inquiry and, and trial, which he got to the bottom of, and yeah. he was then respected as a human rights lawyer right, okay. linked to the military? Um, I don't know what his fuel was, but he went wayward on his moral compass, yeah. and he was punishing human life, Yeah, me plus everyone else who was involved in this. How many people were involved in it? 
quite a lot because anyone who was involved with the bodies were then a part of it. So it was us within Battle of Danny Boy and the movement, which was probably by the end of it, I would say 15 to 20 maybe. And then you've got the process of all the prisoners and then the dead yeah. of other people then being involved, which could have been 10, 15. Yeah. So there was there would have been a lot, yeah. a lot. And uh, so it wasn't just me, which was like punished mm. with, with his actions. And it was just a real shame. It was it was a shame, but I'm not going to kick him when he's down. You know, I'm I'm a man of honor, Dodge. And, yeah. you know, I can see that there's not. I'm not going to achieve anything by doing that or slating him in the book. I don't even rinse him in the book. Yeah. I just said, you know, there was, it's unfortunate that people have that desire to yeah. do some, you know, terrible things. And it's unfortunate because I paid for it. Surely it must be to do with money for him. I would have thought so. That's what I think. If you're talking a public inquiry of 31 million, God knows what percentage he's got from that, whatever he it was may paying, be. He was paying middlemen bungs of money as well in Istanbul to come up with these allegations. Right. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mate, this is some story. <laughs> oh, man, really, isn't it? It's, um, Crazy. Yeah. So then so then when you got you cleared your name, when so tell me about the uh tell me about the book Double Crossed. Yeah. Here from yourself, the story that inspired the BBC drama Danny Boy that came out last month and yeah. had huge ratings and That's everyone's unreal. like it's amazing. Yeah. Tell me the about how did you get involved in what happened there? Tell me that story. I wrote my book and um it took me a long time to write it, if I'm honest, because Oh, it was hard. It was yeah. cathartic, but also yeah. hard. When I started writing about other things that I hadn't, I'd switched off from, yeah. resurfaced. And but I got it done. And then uh, shortly after, my life rights were optioned. But I thought, listen, that done happen. <laughs> the percentage of a real life story being made into film only happens to celebrities. Yeah. It doesn't happen to people like me. Yeah. Like, I just, I'm a, I was a young boy which wanted to make a bit of a difference to this country that we yeah. live in. That was it. That's who I am. That's what yeah. I stand for. All of a sudden, they're like, yeah, we want to option your life rights. And I was like, look how that ain't going to happen. <laughs> and they did. So we had a big negotiation thing. And yeah, got the producers um, who wanted to work with me. I then spent hours and hours and hours with them with like this, sharing yeah. content, sharing yeah. images and sharing everything that I yeah. had from that. And, um, and then I was in London working uh, in the office group because that's what I got at the army and worked in London for, for a um, in property for a flexible workspace. And uh, I got a phone call when I was in Waterloo. They said, can you go to a quiet area? And I was like, yeah, I went to a quiet area. And they said, Brian, just want to let you know that everyone is around the, 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 the phone call at the moment and it's been greenlit. Wow. Your story is going to go to screen. And I was wow. like, oh, unreal. Massive respect yeah, to you, mate. It's crazy, What honestly. you've gone through is outrageous to listen to all these stories. No, but honestly, the thing is, I Dodge, I just, I find it hard to to accept it because I know that I'm not the only one to yeah, yeah, be challenged yeah. you know I know that yeah. and it's life is 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 adversity yeah. you know it's it's brilliant but it's challenging and yeah but I don't know I, I'm not good at taking praise but because yeah. I'm just like one question for you have you dealt with all the trauma or have you suppressed some of it I don't think um, I think I have acknowledged it all and spoken about it all it's never it's never going to go it's it's a battle scar that will remain with me until i i leave this planet but i now have created a toolkit to support me when i'm feeling different yeah. emotions which was the best thing i'd ever done by going and seeking some professional yeah. help because i got into why i was feeling certain ways why i was being angry why i was feeling you know a bit of anxiety why i was blaming myself sometimes mm. and it's stuff that i really shouldn't have been blaming myself yeah. but it just because it, when you're inundated with negativity it, it kind of creeps in sometimes yeah. and could i have done better yeah could i have done anything different on the battlefield could i have prevented life yeah all of this i was like my head was in orbit mm. with it all and uh, when i spoke to a professional it just really it was incredible so yeah. i think i've definitely um spoken about everything but it's never all going to go away no, course, it's going to be there definitely i've just got to say one thing i've got to say a massive massive respect to your wife i know she doesn't get mentioned a lot and do you know what because well, 
she's stuck by yeah. you this whole time. Yeah. You dealing with your emotions that she's had to deal with, the emotions of the kids, everything that you've gone through without a decompression or coming yeah. back from the battlefield straight to your family. And then the court case, uh -huh. the highs of going to see the queen and being a hero to the yeah. lows of those five years. What a woman. Yeah. And what a, what an amazing set of kids you got. And just mm. to finish this off, I've absolutely blown away by this whole story. And I really hope everyone has really enjoyed this and goes and watch Danny Boy and goes and buys your book, Double Crossed. And I'd just like to say thank you so much for serving our country and coming here today and telling your story. No, it's been an absolute privilege, Dodge, and thank you. And you've got an incredible setup, yes. by the way. So, uh, <laughs> good man. Yeah, it's been great. And the weather's cool. So I look forward to getting a bit of sun. You're a good man, no, Woody. Thank you, Massive man. respect to you. Cheers, Dodge. Cheers, fella.